Good evening. Welcome back to the first night of our World Outreach Conference. This is day one of many more days to come. Trust you're having a good time. What you heard already this morning through Dr. Stumbo and what you've had a chance to interact with those in the student center along the way, this could be your day if God takes your world and makes it something completely different. I want to read for you a passage that's kind of the theme for the week from 1 Peter 3 as we introduce this evening. 1 Peter 1, actually, verses 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peter sets up the rest of his letter with this issue of, you've got an inheritance To get it, you're going to go through the fire. Tonight, we're going to hear a story from a friend that I've met just recently from Sudan who has lived this very thing. And she's going to tell you what it means to follow Christ in the midst of fire and come out the other side so that her faith, which has been tested and found to be like gold, results in praise of her father. May that be the reality for all of us this evening. I want to invite you to stand and worship with us as we get started. Turn it over to our friends. Sing, I'm laying down my life. I'm laying down my life. I'm giving up control. I'm never looking back. I surrender all. For your glory on the earth, this passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul to see the nations bow for all the world to know. I'm living for your glory. the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me let's continue to sing this passion this passion in my heart is stirring in my soul to see the nations bow for all the world to know I'm living for your glory on the earth sing it out for the sake of the world for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light of soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me sing that again for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, like a fire in me. For every knee, for every knee to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, 
burn like a fire in me for every tongue to confess you alone are the king you are the hope of the earth burn like a fire in me for every knee to bow down for every heart to believe for every voice to cry out burn like a fire in me for every tongue to confess you alone are the king you are the hope of the earth for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me like a fire in me sing it out for the sake for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me like a fire in me for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me light a flame in my soul for every eye to see for the sake of the world burn like a fire in me in my heart break me apart I need you to open my eyes and see that you're shaping my life all I am I serve Trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you mine. I need you. Soften my heart to pierce through the dark. I need you to cleanse and cleanse every part of me. All I am, I serve. Trust what you say, that you're good, your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I may be weak, but your spirit strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Give me faith to trust what you say, Daddy, you're good. 
may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. Spirit strong in me, my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Heavenly Father, we are in awe before you. God, we ask that you speak to us tonight. We need you. We need you to change us. pray that you will burden our hearts for lost people. Give us a passion for spreading the gospel, for spreading the good news about your story and about your love. God, we are so undeserving, but you're so good and so loving and so kind. We thank you so much for that. speak to us, that you will enable us to live empowered through the spirit that lives in us. Help us to walk in the victory that you won on the cross, and help us to take that power and that victory that we get to live in and share it with other people. God, speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, thank you. Beautiful. Tonight, we have a great opportunity to hear the story of someone we don't often get to hear from, uh, a young lady who's made her way. I think if she would to say, how is it possible? I'm in Toccoa Falls on September, or February the 7th, what day is it? September the 6th, I guess, in 2018. How is that even possible that I'm here? And the answer is, God's the answer to that question. How else would you answer that question? from northern Sudan by way of, she'll tell the rest of the story. Let's welcome Mary and her husband Ryan to the stage, please. Mary. She will give you the details of their story, her story as well. I just want to let you know that this is who they are. And they're going to be with us following this moment here over in the Jim at the International Festival. I think it's a really cool thing that's going on we'll talk about later, but you want to visit with these people, and perhaps your life may, inter may be intertwined with theirs down the road. So, Mary, Ryan, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's a big blessing to be here tonight with you. Ryan and I are um, excited for this opportunity. This is our first um, speaking engagement for this year. Um, we've been doing quite a bit, but the other side of the state, you know, in Michigan, Ohio. <laughs> so we're excited to be here with you and um, to share God's story um, in my life. Um, it's really, as, as the professor just said a minute ago, um, Georgia, the United States, North Sudan, only God could do things like that. And um, I grew up in a Muslim home. We grew up Muslim in Northern Sudan. Um, how many of you know where Sudan in Africa, the map of Africa? Okay, cool. So, um, Northeast Africa, 
It used to be the largest African country by land before 2011, separated to north and south. Uh, we had a history of war, um, civil war, and um, basically the north is a dominantly Muslim. In the south, um, they have um, um, they have Christianity there too, but they have also other um, African beliefs. So I grew up Muslim in a Muslim home, uh, praying five times a day. Uh, fasting Ramadan. In 2004, I graduated law school, and my journey started, um, well, actually, God's journey started with me. Um, I wanted to learn English. Arabic is the first language spoken in Sudan, so I see noon, the letter noon, which is kind of cool. Um, um, it's one, you know, refers to one of the important chapters of the Quran, of course. So thank you for praying for Muslims and for having a heart for the um, Muslims. Um, I graduated and I started looking for jobs and unfortunately I needed to work, um, you know, kind of practice my English and my English tutor was the person that helped me to come to Christ. Um, growing up Muslim is kind of very interesting. The family is very strong, you know, like strong bonds to the family, respect your mom and dad. Um, the relationship with Allah is basically based on fear more than, more than anything else. You try to please Allah, but personally you don't have that connection and relationship with him. Um, so all of my life I was praying for a God that I actually didn't have any personal connection with. Uh, I tried to reach him, but I never felt like he was trying to reach out to me. And then when I met my English tutor, um, he was Christian, and I didn't know he was Christian, and he actually gave me a little Bible, and we started talking about the difference between Christianity and Islam, and um, I was kind of, you know, you grow up Muslim, you just think Islam is the only religion, you still don't believe in it fully, you don't understand it fully, but you just have a big commitment to Islam, and uh, I remember I had a conversation with them you know, about the difference between the two religions and how, how could you, how dare you to think God has a son and, you know, and his son died and on the cross. There's just crazy stories um, in the Bible. And the Bible is not even, you know, the true transcript. And Muslims believe, some of you know, that um, God has sent prophets and messengers through time. And um, Jesus Christ was just a prophet. He's not a son of God. And the last prophet is Muhammad. That's why... Everyone must believe in Muhammad, you know, to have connection with God. So um, what really um, was very interesting to me, that my tutor was very calm and peaceful, and that was the Holy Spirit in him. So he would not argue back, and actually he would just kind of tell me peacefully how, explain things to me, like what is salvation, and how salvation works, and what's the story, like historical stories between the difference between Islam and the Quran and Christianity and the Bible. And um, I was very curious, and I, you know, start reading the Bible. I took the Bible home, I remember, and I was trying to prove them wrong and just pull all the wrong things out of the Bible. But it was just beautiful to read the scripture and um, to feel the connection to the Holy Spirit. Um, I remember um, the language of the Bible was very basic, simple, beautiful, easy. Unlike the Quran, I have most of the Quran memorized. And, um, and basically, you know, God in the Bible is, in the New Testament, is more of a loving God and, and a lot of good stories. Unlike in the Quran, a lot of kind of hard, difficult stories for me. So I, um, I started comparing things, reading Old Testament. It was hard for me to um, just kind of think of the Son of God. That was just very difficult. Uh, one of the first verses that Muslim kids memorize when they're little is God has no son. And it's actually one of the verses that all Muslims pray five times a day, every day. So somehow that's stuck somewhere in you and you believe in it even, you know, you just kind of memorize it and repeat it five times a day since you're seven years old. And, and, and it's just hard for you to understand how could God, how could he have a son? What does that mean? And... Um, I went to bed, and I had all these questions about salvation, like is a free gift, what does that mean? And uh, the Son of God, the Son of God, and what does that mean? And I go to bed, and um, early in the morning, actually around 2 
o'clock in the morning, I woke up on a voice um, calling me to get up and read my Bible, open my Bible. And I remember um, I opened the Bible and I opened in Galatians chapter 3 and um, uh, immediately opened on chapter 3. And the chapter was glowing in the dark, like was becoming gold. And it was scary too, so I will kind of close the Bible and open it again and it will just open again on, you know, same chapter. And I flipped the pages to chapter 4 and 5 um, and they were all the same, um, glowing in the dark beautiful and that voice was telling me to read it it's for you and I started reading them and somehow they had all the answers for the questions that I had in mind about um, the son of God who is he and um, salvation is a free gift equality between men and women and, and God sees it all the same and that was very powerful so in the morning I would just you know I kind of went to my tutor and I said this is what happened, what does that mean? If Does that have any significance in your religion? If I had questions in my mind and I find them in the Bible, and he was telling me the Holy Spirit was connecting, God was connecting to you through his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is um, uh, kind of trying to show you the truth, and I said, what is the Holy Spirit? And that was the first time for me to, to hear of the Holy Spirit. And he was telling me the Holy Spirit is God himself, and he, you know, he helps you to learn of God, uh, about God, and he helps you to um, worship God and get saved. And he was telling me just a lot of beautiful things, and I felt in my heart like I wanted the Holy Spirit. But also I was still Muslim, and I was still connected to Islam. And um, I felt kind of like maybe I should still be Muslim but have the Holy Spirit. Is that possible? <laughs> And he was like, no, it just doesn't work that way. You will believe in Jesus Christ. This is when you will receive the spirit. That's what the scripture says. And, you know. So I wasn't ready yet. I was still had a lot of challenges, fears. You know, growing a Muslim in a Muslim country where it's illegal to change from Islam to any other faith. And according to the law, if you change, um, you will be given some days to repent. And then if you don't repent, you'll be killed in public. That's the law. And, um, you know, for someone who studied the law and all the law and all of that, it's just hard to think, what, what will my family think of me? And what will happen to me if I change my faith? And, um, but I was still very attracted to this new belief. And I was really attracted to the God in this book. And I will still read the Bible, and I will stay up late and read and read the scripture. And I, I remember I was reading Acts, um, the scripture, when um, the disciples healed the crippled man that was begging beside the beautiful gate. And in my heart, I felt like I was kind of thinking, how amazing. Jesus said, when you believe in me, you will do what I do and greater things. And the disciples, in Jesus' name, healed that crippled man, and, you know, he started walking and, and bouncing out of joy. And I went to bed with, you know, with kind of all these thoughts in my head. And the, the Muslim prayers are, as you know, five prayers a day. And the first one is early in the morning, around 5 o'clock, 5 a.m. And my family had the traditions of getting up for the morning prayers. And, and I was a Sunni Muslim, and in the Sunni faith, the men go to the mosque and the women pray at home. So around 5 a.m., my father will get up early and my brothers and they will go to the mosque for the prayer. And right around that time, I, I woke up hearing my mom crying and saying, your father is dead, your father is dying, you know, he's dead, come help us. She was just kind of squealing and crying and running all over. And... I just got up and ran to their bedroom, and um, the first thing I saw, my dad was laying on the, on the ground. He wasn't moving. He wasn't talking. Um, he had a heart attack before that time, and that was the uh, second one. Um, and just, you know, that same voice that woke me up before, I felt like was telling me to pray in Jesus' name because Jesus has that power of healing people and bringing people to life. And... Um, I sat down by my dad and, tried, and, you know, put my hand on his body and I started praying for him. Um, you know, 
what I what I read deep in the Bible that like, you pray in Jesus' name, you pray in in, in my name, in my power, and, and this person would be healed. And I said, okay, Jesus, if all the things that I've been reading about you <laughs> are true, and you're really the Son of God and you're God, and please heal my father and bring him back to life, heal him now. And when I got done praying, my father just got up. And um, for me, that was, <laughs> amen, going to that. So I was like, okay, now I can't deny him. He proved himself wrong, right to me, not wrong. <laughs> and I prayed and accepted the Lord. And that was actually in 2004, January 24th. Um, so I hid my faith from my family because the very, very strict religious, um, you know, Muslims. And I started taking discipleship classes and meet with some some people. And um, it was just beautiful. I could feel the changes in me. I could feel I'm a new person, you know. I could feel the Holy Spirit. Um, and, um, and I was hiding my faith. So um, I was working my master's at the time, too. And I will sneak, you know, after classes sometime and go for prayer meetings and and one day I came back home and it was a little later than usual and I get home and they found my, you know, my brothers found my Bibles. I have three brothers and one sister. My father worked for the government in North Sudan. He was a governor for about four years. He worked for the army. He's an engineer. My mom is a teacher and I have three brothers and one sister. And one older brother, the rest are younger, but in the Muslim faith, always the male have um, power over the women in the, in the family. So I come home, and they start questioning me um, about my faith, about the books that they found, and um, um, I kind of like it was the moment for me to, should I tell them or not, should I deny it, but the truth is still powerful, you know, and God is real, and he's bigger than my fears, and bigger than my family, and, and bigger than Islam. So I told them I converted to Christianity. When they heard that, they got very angry and mad. Um, so I used to dress up like Muslim, cover my hair, and, you know, all of that. And they grabbed me out, my, out of my scarf and hit me against the wall and threw me out there and started beating me and over and over, my brothers and my mom and everyone was just super mad and angry and, you know, you're bringing us shame. We don't have Christians. What is this new things that you're bringing? You have demons in you, spirits. Yeah, my dad wasn't home at the time. Um, he was actually, he went out up north, um, closer to Egypt somewhere for prayer meetings. And uh, when he came home, they told him, and he was very, very upset, took some scissors that were laying on the table, came and wanted to stab me with the scissors. My grandmother was closer to him, and she kind of pushed him back and said, let's not kill her. Let's just, you know, hear from her. And the same grandma later on accepted Christ, too, so everything in God's, <laughs> you know, in God's planning. And um, um, I just told him, even, you know, I prayed in Jesus' name for you to come back to life and um but again again the spirits that that was on them was stronger and they didn't understand anything all they did was just beat me over and over lock me in a room and just saying you know you have demons and my dad said i'll kill you myself i'm not gonna report you know to report you to the police you're bringing us shame and you probably heard about the honor killing which is a father or a brother or an uncle in this case could have killed me easily and um, that's okay you know in, by law so I was locked in a room and they were um, deciding what to do and finally they said they will send me to an Islamic school where basically I'll be chained and beat up and you know because I have all the Christianity the Christians demons in me you know all that kind of treatment and um, before they were just talking about that, and before the leader, the Muslim leader, like, come to the house to get me, um, it just felt in my heart like God wanted me to run away, to just walk away. And it was impossible in my head. Like, they were sitting here in the living room, and my mom, my superior in the kitchen, and I was locked in this room, and I can't go anywhere. 
but miraculously, just God gave me the strength and the power to get up, open the door, and just walk away. And nobody saw me walking away, actually. I opened the door, and I went on the streets. A little minivan stopped for me. I don't even, didn't even know the guy. I jumped in the car, and I just said, could you take me to this house? And it's one of the believers that used to disciple me. So he took me to his house. Basically, he, should, he could have taken me back because I had all this blood and bruises and, you know, being beaten. And in the culture, if you see someone with that kind of face, and you know, that means they've, they've done something wrong and you should take them back. But somehow he protected me and took me to, um, to my friend's house. My friends were connected with some missionaries from Texas that lived in my hometown. Anybody from Texas here? <laughs> So I went, they took me in, and they hid me at their home for about nine months. My pictures were everywhere. The police were looking for me, and God just protected the missionary. They had three little boys, and just amazing how God connects the dots and, and do things. I stayed at their house for nine months, and later on, God opened the door for me to travel to the Nuba Mountains, closer to the south, um, South Sudan. Uh, where I met my husband, Ryan. That was in 2005. He was a missionary there, too. Um, I worked for Samaritan's Purse, and I stayed there for about two years before I came to the States in 2007. Um, um, 2011, went to Taylor University, small Christian college in Indiana, graduated, then went to law school, Regent University in Virginia, graduated in 2015. I work now... Um, for the public defender in Somerville. And uh, we have three kids. Um, we, yes, I need to want more too. <laughs> more, only five more. And uh, we, uh, he's like, what are you saying? <laughs> God has been so grateful and he's been so great and faithful to us. Uh, we've been supporting the church in North Sudan and also in Kenya, where Ryan has been a missionary a while before he met me. Uh, we have a business, an essential oil company that supports our business, and we have our booth out there somewhere. If you want to talk to Ryan, he's an organic farmer, a missionary, and a dad. <laughs> a great <No> man. <laughs> And if you, um, if you have any questions, you want to meet us, you want to talk to us, you have any question about my story and, or about, you know, our ministry and how you could pray for us and partner with us, um, you're welcome to be part of that. You want to say something? It's a moment to recap here. Three minutes left. <laughs> Over three minutes. So just amazing. Um, she covered it, but it's amazing that, you know, the scriptures would glow in the dark. And that God would be there in a time of need. No man brought her to Christ. You know, she was born again um, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And she's powerful. So we, we thank you guys. Um, if you guys would join us in prayer, partner with us in prayer for family back home, um, for family around the world, um, you know, Muslims and, um, you know, all of the men, women, and children of the earth don't know Christ. And so that, that's a big request on our behalf. So you sit for three minutes over. I will hand this over. But uh, the worship here, fantastic. Thank you to the worship leader um, earlier this evening. Amazing to uh, be with you guys and I appreciate your prayers and um, partnering in prayer for our family in Africa. Thank you so much. We all join me in standing and singing the uh, chorus of Forsake the Lord and Savior of the World one more time. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Like a fire in me. Sing for the sake of the world. 
For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Father, thank you for the chance to hear from one of your children tonight, your amazing grace to her, which is amazing grace to us. As we celebrate, we pray at the same time for her family and for others in that same world who are reaching out to find Jesus, but they are a vast, small, chaste, harassed minority who need the power of God today to set them free. Celebrate with Mary and her husband in your deliverance from death and brought her into life, from darkness to light. We pray for the Muslim world who remains in that, under that oppressive, dark, empty space that needs the light of Jesus to set them free. Father, in this room, there are some who might be able to go, to go to Sudan or to Ethiopia go to Saudi Arabia or Iraq or somewhere else where Islam reigns and don't yet have Jesus. Enable us, encourage us, provide for us, give us grace to latch on to you that others like Mary may know the life-giving, sin-forgiving Savior, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. If you want to hear more of Mary and Ryan's story, they're going to be in the gym at our international festival just right now, and you can talk about what they're doing there and how you might be able to be a part of that kind of thing. Tomorrow morning, back here at 10 o'clock for day two. Tomorrow night, have an exile night here in this area as well, 6.30 to 8.30. Look forward to seeing you all tonight, tomorrow night, and in the morning. Have a good night. Thank you.